Let's take our Bible. Uh, where do I want to start? Let's go to uh, let's go to Revelation five. We'll start there, and um, we're studying the doctrine of the Bible and um, what the Bible says about the Bible. Where where should we get our doctrine concerning the blood of Christ? We should get it from the Bible. Where should we get our doctrine concerning who God is? We get it from the Bible. Doctrine of salvation from the Bible. Doctrine of baptism from the Bible. Doctrine or eschatology. Study of last day's events. We should get it from the Bible. Where should we get our doctrine of the Bible? From the Bible. Not the Bible scholars. Not the Bible quote unquote experts. Because they get it wrong. But the Bible uh, tells it right. And in Revelation 5 we see the importance of God ordaining and blessing a book a book and i uh, probably talked a little bit about this last wednesday night so we're going to kind of spill that over into something else here in a little bit but revelation chapter 5 verse 1 is a good starting place and i i saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, were, uh, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which, and we, this kind of looks weird to us, but that's the description given of the lamb. He has seven horns and the seven eyes, and both of those represent the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. If you study the life of Jesus, you'll notice that Jesus at, at certain times said that the Father hath given all things into my hand. Jesus, knowing the Father, hath delivered all things into his hand. And what that is, is what you're seeing here in Revelation 5. Here is God with all things. Everything is in the Bible, and everything, is, everything in the Bible is about everything that happens in this world, everything that happens in your life, everything that is going to happen in this world, and of course it tells us about the world to come. But it literally is God giving His Son, Jesus, the legal document to rule over this world to rule over the kingdom god is giving him that legal authority and it's written down in a book sealed so that and well let me throw this out to you what's the purpose of sealing something what does it do why would why would you seal something up to preserve it number one okay tupperware tupperware you seal it you put your stuff in there and then you press down on it to squeeze that air out of there and as long as that stays sealed, it's going to be preserved. My mom used to can and jar and put stuff from the garden in mason jars. And she'd always listen for that pop, that lid pop. She knows it's sealed, got a good seal on it. That's one reason for it. Um, somebody give me another one. The reason why you would seal something. Why did a king... Wear a, wear a ring that was his seal. What did that, when he, when he used that ring, what did that show? Authority. Okay? Just like when you go to a, if you've ever had a document notarized, that notary has a seal that they use. They affix to a document saying, I've checked this person's credentials. They are who they say they are. And I seal this, giving it legal authority. And so the purpose of the seals was to also give legal authority. So it preserves, it shows God's authority on it. And the fact that there's only one 
who is worthy to take over the kingdom of God. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ. And then, you know, something I always like to share with people is that when you're reading the Bible, the only one who is qualified to open up your understanding of God's word is Jesus Christ. He's the only one. I can't do it. No other preacher can do it. No prophet, no priest, no Bible college, no publishing company, no church, nothing on this earth is qualified to open up the Bible to man's understanding. Only Jesus can do that. And I, I preached a message years ago about the difference between the open Bible and the closed Bible. And I said, if you find yourself in a prolonged series in life where you haven't read nor touched nor thought of your Bible, for some reason, God closed up his word to you. And that ought to make you a little scared. That ought to worry you. Why would God close his book to my understanding? Why would God do that? Well, God's obviously trying to, the fact that you thought about it, God's trying to get your attention, and I believe God would open it back up to you when you've made things right with God or whatever God's trying to deal with you about. But clearly Jesus said, I am he that openeth and no man shutteth, and he that shutteth and no man openeth. And I've mentioned this before, there's been countless people who have read the Bible throughout history that never believed a word of it. It's because God closed their mind. He closed the understanding of that word and the belief of that word, and they were shut up to it, so they didn't, they didn't get anything out of it. So anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll ask God to bless the remainder of our study. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us a beautiful day today. We thank you for that beautiful sunshine and a little bit nice warm weather you sent our way, and we appreciate it, Father, in the midst of this winter time. And Father, we pray, dear God, that you would open up, as you did the sun today, that you'd open up the light of your word to us and to our hearts tonight. I thank you for these that are gathered here. Lord, I'm very thankful for these that have gathered here tonight, and I'm very thankful for these that have gathered with us online. I pray, dear God, that you would bless them, and, and uh, Lord, help us to be an encouragement to one another. Let the words that are said tonight and spoken from your word be an encouragement to all of us, Father reinstated in our hearts and in our minds that we that we believe the right faith we have the right religion we are holding on to the right book we're on the right side of things father Re just reinstate that in our hearts tonight lest anybody have some doubt or maybe somebody struggling with the bible i've done it father and i pray dear god that you would just bless somebody tonight and just, just fill our hearts and our minds once again with the joyful, incredible things that come out of your word tonight. Just bless us tonight as we study. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, uh, let me read these very quickly. Job 10, 19, 23. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. He got his wish. Got his wish. Amen. Job was the first book written. Job lived about the same time Abraham did. Isaiah 30, now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. And again, God is establishing the idea that I'm going to write it down. I'm going to make sure it's written down. And then when it's written down, I'm going to make sure that it lasts forever. Not ever. Don't worry. God says to us, don't worry. I will never let corruption come to my word. I'll never let that happen. Jeremiah 30, verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. God, if God told those guys anything, he told them to write it down. Ezra, I like Ezra. If you've ever studied the life of Ezra, what was Ezra's occupation? Was he a cattle farmer? Was he a dairy farmer? Was he a pea patch picker? What was he? He was a ready, this Ezra went up from Babylon and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And understand the history, the context behind who Ezra is and why God raised him up at this time. Ezra is a man 
who lives in Babylon. He's a Jewish man, but he finds himself in Babylon. And God used this man. He was a scribe, meaning it was he spent his life copying and making copies of God's word. That's what he did. And in those days, we understand that was no easy process. You know, and I've heard these things about how the Jews handled the, the scriptures. They handled them. They had, a, they had a way of checking to make sure that, you know, the copies they made were 100% perfect. And, if a, if, and they had some sort of numbering system. I heard that. They, they would number out each line. And if each line's numbers matched the original copy, then that copy was okay and they kept it. But if the copy that they copied had errors in it, they burn it. They lit a match to it and they burn it, which is why when it comes to looking at the Old Testament manuscript evidence, there's very little discrepancies in any of the Old Testament documents. And we've got, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found the oldest Old Testament manuscripts that had ever been seen by modern mankind. I mean, these things, were, these things predated Jesus Christ. The Dead Sea Scrolls did. And when they began to compare them with the latest or the, or the last known Hebrew manuscripts that we had, they found out that they were almost identical. And that's because the Jewish scribes just had a rule that said, if this copy has errors, it doesn't survive. We don't leave it for the next generation. We get rid of it so that there really is no argument about the Hebrew Old Testament and what should be there and what shouldn't be there. The argument comes with the New Testament. But with the Old Testament, you had scribes. You had men whose job it was to copy the manuscripts and copy the law of Moses so that every generation had that law. So Ezra was this man that God used as Israel is uh, the ten tribes are up in Assyria. The two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, are in Babylon. And when they come back from Babylon, God has arranged a man by the name of Ezra to make sure that when they came back from Babylon into Jerusalem once again, they had a copy of the Word of God with them. God said, I'm not sending you back home empty-handed. The book that your granddaddy used to read, we still have it. The book that Moses wrote, we still have it. The laws and the commandments that God gave to our people himself, we still have those. God used Ezra the ready scribe before the Lord to make sure that the copies of the manuscripts that he had were exactly identical to the copies that his forefathers had. God preserved his word. Amen. All right. Uh, Luke. You look at a guy named Luke. Luke starts out his gospel by saying this. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. God laid it on the heart of Luke to pay attention to, to the times that he was living in, to pay attention to the life of Jesus Christ. And, you know, we don't know, but maybe probably Luke throughout the things that happened that he wrote about, he might have been writing them out as they happened. Either way, the Holy Ghost inspired Luke to write those things down. And I've mentioned this guy named uh, Daniel, I think his name's Lewis. He is, quote unquote, the conservative scholar at Dallas Theological Seminary, Southern Baptist Seminary, who made the statement and said... It is a fallacy for us to believe that we have the exact words that Jesus spoke. It may make us feel good to believe that our red letter edition Bibles and the words in red are in fact the words of Jesus, but everybody knows that as soon as something is said, it's very difficult to remember, then write out exactly what somebody said. So this guy's idea was 
I don't care how many times you read the Bible, and I don't care how many verses you memorize, and I don't care how many words are in red. They're probably not exactly what Jesus said. He's a liar. He's a liar. He doesn't. He didn't get this idea from the Bible anywhere. He did not read anywhere in the scriptures where the scriptures shall be wrong. He never read that. This is something he was either taught and believed or he invented it himself and he teaches it to all his students, which is what happened to me. There's a, a, a comic put out by Chick Publications uh, that I read when I was a teenager. It's called Sabotage. Have you read that one? It's about the Bible. It's one of these, Jack Chick made these full-size comic books and the, and the one called Sabotage was about a young man who goes to Bible college believing that the Bible is God's word. And while he's in Bible college, he hears his professor telling him that there are mistakes in the transmission of the text and that we don't really have all the words that Jesus said and on and on and on, and it messed his mind up. And I read that as a teenager going, that'll never happen to me. That is exactly what happened to me. Exactly what happened to me. I went three years of Bible college, wasted all that money. I wouldn't say as a waste, I learned what not to preach for three years. But they filled my head, Brother James, with we don't have every word of God. It hasn't been all preserved. There are mistakes in all of the Bibles. That's what they taught. So you got all these young preachers coming up who may have been taught all their life that the Bible was the inerrant word of God. When they get, by the time they get out of Bible college, they don't believe it anymore. And then we wonder why the churches are in the condition that they are in. It's because the absence of the truth of the word of God. But God raised up, God raised up men like Ezra. God raised up men like Luke who said, I'm going to write all this stuff down. 1 John 5.13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. The way the gospel was preached when Peter first preached the day of Pentecost is the same way that a person is saved when we preach it now 2,000 years later. It has not changed. Why? Because it's been written down. It is the truth. And if you are ever in a situation where you are doubting your salvation, get the Bible back out and read it. Read it. Believe it. Think on these things and say to yourself, God doesn't lie. I've done this numerous times. God, you, wrote, you said this and you don't lie. Now, I'm gonna, God, I'm going to believe what you said. Okay, I'm going to believe what you said. Don't let me down, God. I've been through that. And you know what? He hasn't let me down. Uh, Revelation 1 11 saying I am Alpha and here's here's Jesus very last book of the Bible the first and the last and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia so he raises these men up and he says to them I'm gonna give you my words write them down and put them into a book Hebrews 1 in fact turn there turn to Hebrews 1 The Bible says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. And we know that there were times when God physically spoke to these men. God spoke physically to Moses. He spoke to various of the prophets. He spoke in a voice to them. They heard that voice. They wrote that down. He spake in time, man, time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds so we recognize the old testament was the word of god given to the various prophets throughout the old testament times and now we recognize that the new testament hath in these last times spoken to us through his son jesus christ and how many books did Jesus write? None of them. Jesus didn't write any of them. But what he spoke, 
the men that followed him were sure to write those words down. And they, so the words don't belong to Luke. They're not John's words. They're not Paul's words. They are the words of Jesus Christ. He owns them. He originated them. And he gave them. Now, I'm going to give you three very important doctrines concerning your Bible. And you, if, I, I would encourage you to take notes on this. Everybody watching online, get a, maybe if you have a place in your Bible where you have an empty page, I'm going to, I want to encourage you to make some notes here. Because the people that you know that are struggling with this Bible issue, is the Bible, is the King James right? Should I read only the King James? Uh, I mentioned to you the other day, Pastor Kelly has asked me to come down on a Sunday. And I'm going to give him a Sunday because he says he wants me to come down and do my thing on the Bible. He wants me to promote the King James. And he, he mentioned to me, he said, there's a young man down there that one of our guys works with. And he said, he's a young, free will Baptist pastor. And I'm going, that sounds familiar. And he said, they get along great, and they talk all the time about how they love the Lord, this and that and the other. But when, when he said, the guy in my church brought up the King James issue, that young pastor said, well, I'm not sure that I go that far. I don't believe a translation can be inspired. Okay, I know that thought because I used to think that. I, that's what I was told to think, and that's what I thought. That's what I believed at one point. So I'm going, I've been there. I know what this guy thinks. I know how he thinks. So he wants me to come down and give the proofs that this Bible is right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out three very clear doctrines on the Bible and why we believe that one of them, at least one of them, is absolutely without error and is right now the inspired word of god why i believe that okay so first of all number one inspiration of the original manuscripts write that down that's heading number one inspiration of the original manuscripts here's what that means it means that when moses sat and he wrote out the law that God gave him, the words that God gave him, the blessing, the cursings that God gave him, that as Moses wrote those out and they were finished, that that physical object, that book, that scroll, was the absolute, inerrant, infallible word of God. Does that make sense to everybody? At, as Moses writing it out in Hebrew, every word that he put on those pages, front, back, give me another scroll, I've got more, God's going to write it down. Jeremiah, when he wrote that, when he had the guy write out the word of God and the king Jehoiakim cut it with a pen knife and threw it into the fire, Jeremiah said, oh, you shouldn't have done that because now I'm going to write them again, I'm going to add more to it, and you're not going to like it. So that's what he did. God, but those words... On those original manuscripts were the inspired word of God. Every word of them. And here's why I keep saying that. The guys that translated the NIV back in the early 70s, they wrote sort of a little treatise on what they believed about the Bible. One of the guys called the Bible, how did he put it? What is it when you ladies, you have a piece of cloth and you knit something into that cloth like a design on the front of it? Embroidery, okay? If you look at the front of the embroidery, it's a beautiful picture of something. What does the back look like? A mess. This guy who helped translate the NIV said, the Bible is not what we think it is. It is the back side of the embroidery. Tangled messed up it is the thoughts of god but not necessarily the words of god so kudos to the free will baptist denomination 40 50 years ago when this issue started springing forth 
the denomination had a meeting and they said, we need to, we need to kind of get specific here with our statement of faith on what we believe the Bible is. So they wrote it out. They said, we believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures. Plenary meaning that it's complete. Everything from Genesis to Revelation, all of those words in there are the word of God. And number two, the verbal inspiration. God didn't just inspire the thoughts to the men and they wrote them down as best they could. He gave them the exact words to write down. And there's a difference. There's a difference between what the law says and how someone might interpret what the law says. Okay? So which are you going to get in trouble for? What the law says. Okay? So that's, that's why it's important that we, that we understand that God didn't just transmit generic thoughts to these men and they wrote them down in the words that they wanted to write them down in. It's important that we believe that the beast really did have seven heads and ten horns. And that Jerusalem above has streets made with the purest gold. Those are not just the thoughts of God, those are the words of God. And every word that God sent down to these men that they wrote down on those originals was absolutely without any error the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Greek word there is theopneustos. That means God breathed. What, that's the same way of saying inspiration of God. Inspiration, we have the word inspire, which is, has the word like breath in it. Spira. Okay? So it's, it's the same word. All scripture is given by the breath of God or the inspiration of God. All scripture, meaning Every single word that those guys wrote down was the exact words that God wanted them to write down. Now, what's interesting to me is God was able to use the difference between when you read Matthew and you read John, you can see that there's a, a difference in style. Every writer has a style that they write in. Every artist has a style that they sketch or paint in. Every musician has a style that they play in. The notes are there on the paper, but each musician interprets them a little bit differently. And what's fascinating to me is, is that Jesus was in each one of these men, and each one of their characters was present as they're writing them out, but those were still the exact words that God chose. God was using the particular character of John. John liked to use the phrase, bear witness or bear record. I don't know if you've noticed that. When you read the Gospel of John, the letters of John, and the book of Revelation, John's favorite term is bear witness, bear record. He uses that several times. You don't see it too many times other places in the Bible, but it's uniquely John. Well, that doesn't mean that they were John's words based upon God's thoughts. It still means they were God's words, but God was using the uniqueness of John to provide a little bit different character to that particular part of the Bible. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Just like he uses different of us preachers we all have our own different styles. We, have a, we all have the different stupid jokes we tell. We all stutter at different points or whatever, but God still uses us all. Uh, 2 Peter 1.21, turn there. And you can write, just write the verses, the verse references down in your note. 2 Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, holy men of God. So we, we assume that it was about 40 of those men that God assigned the role of writing down the very words that God gave them. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 and we'll see the, the method of transmission. We'll see sort of how God delivered these words down. 
Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Not my thoughts, not my fog, not my feelings. I've put my words in thy mouth. So what was Jeremiah then obligated to do? Take those exact words and both speak them and write them down. Okay, and that's what we believe he did. So again, if I say I believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of every word of God in those original manuscripts, I'm giving you the scriptures why I believe that. Because as we move forward, I'm going to say, I believe that inspiration extends beyond the original manuscripts, number one. And number two, I'm going to say, I believe that inspiration and preservation is still intact this day. In other words, I don't just believe that the originals were inspired word of God. I don't limit it to just those original documents. It is extended beyond that, and I have scripture to prove it. In my mind, it, it proves it. Okay? So, again, we're getting our doctrine of the Bible from the Bible and not from the seminary. Ezekiel 2, turn there. <clears throat> this is interesting because now God's going to do it a different way. He takes Ezekiel, if you remember Ezekiel 1, he sees the, the God's four-wheel drive chariot coming down from heaven. He sees one like unto the Son of Man sitting on that, the appearance of the bow and the cloud of the day of rain. This is the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 7, God said to Ezekiel, and thou shalt speak my words unto them. Not my thoughts. My words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. Are we supposed to try to give people the word of God even though we think they're probably not going to listen to it? Yeah, what is it going to hurt? I mean, they, not, they may try to swing at you, they may shoot you. But just because you think in your mind, well, they're not going to listen to me, that does not excuse any of us from trying to give them the Word of God. Give them the Word of God. Whether they accept it or reject it is up to them. But God said, Thou shalt speak my words unto them in verse 7. So look in verse 9, same chapter. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. That is the exact same description as the book that was in God's right hand in Revelation 5. It was in God's right hand, it was written within on one side, and it was written without on the back side. The meaning of that, I think, is obvious. It's complete. There are no more words to be added to it. I'm not going to give you half of a book for you to fill in what you want on the back side of it. The book that I give you is complete. And, these, and this is the total of all of the words that I have. Nothing to be added, nothing to be taken away. I'll use this illustration. I've, I've talked about this before. This really shocked me. A guy was on this TBN program called it Supernatural. And he said that uh, Jesus took him up into heaven and he was in heaven's library. And he was surrounded by all of these books up in heaven's library and he was fascinated. And Jesus explains to him 
these are all the things that I've said and done that couldn't be put into the four Gospels. So the guy's just, oh, this is outstanding. Jesus said, when I send you back down to earth, I'll let you take two, any two books that you want and take them back down with you. So the guy just beside himself, and he looks around, and he sees one particular book, and he grabs it, and Jesus said, uh, except that one. Why can't I take this one? Well, they're not ready for it yet. And on the spine of the book was John 22. There's only 21 chapters in the book of John. And the John 21 is the last of the gospel chapters. So what would John 22 represent? Another gospel. An addition to what we've had now for 2,000 years. So he puts it back on the shelf. Jesus says, I can't let you take that one now. They're not ready for that yet. But I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. One of these days, I'm going to call you back up. And when I do, you'll know then that the world is ready to receive what's written in John 22. And then I'll let you bring that book back down to the earth and give it to my disciples. And everybody in the audience was going, oh, wow, amen. Woo, boy, we can't wait for that. That is a setup. It's setting those people up for an angel to come from heaven with another gospel. Because it's going to happen. Paul didn't just pull that idea. If he would read an angel from heaven, bringing it, he didn't just pull that out of thin air. That's what's going It already happened with Joseph Smith, and it's going to happen again. So the words that are in your Bible are complete understand that nothing to be added nothing to be taken away from but you see what it reflects to me brother george it reflects it reflects the attitude of modern churchianity that just isn't satisfied with what the bible has to say it doesn't give them any fulfillment they want more than what's in this book and I say, I'm not anywhere near done getting stuff out of this book. Amen? So, but that's, that's why it was written on both sides. So, Ezekiel 2, verse 9 and 10 again. In verse 10, he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. So, in Ezekiel 3, verse 1. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat thou that thou findest. Eat this roll. And go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. Verse 4, and he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. There's several things that are meant by this, but one of them is, this is the, this is the transmission method. God, in the form of Ezekiel eating this roll. By the way, what did it taste like? Honey. Just like the manna tasted like in the wilderness. Just like David said, thy words are sweeter than honey. So he eats it and it tastes like honey. And he, he, it's in his belly. The belly, the bosom is the, like where your soul is, the seat of your emotions, the seat of your being. It was in him. And the idea is preachers can't preach it if it ain't in them first. I can't give you what I don't have given to me. I can't do it. So it's my role to study, to learn more. And once I've studied, start it over again. Study it some more because there's more there. But that was the method of transmission. And it's the very words of God that Ezekiel was then to transmit to mankind. Um, Exodus 17, 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Exodus 34, 27. The Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words have I made a covenant with thee and with Israel. 
Isaiah 8, 1, Moreover the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll, and write in it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hashbaz. You ought to name one of your grandchildren that. That would be an awesome name to name somebody. It's my son, Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Isaiah 30, verse 8, Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book. Write it down. The inspired words were written once they were transmitted to these men and they spoke them. They then wrote them down. Jeremiah 30, verse 2. Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. V chapter 36, verse 2. Take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel. Jeremiah 36, 28. Take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. And here what you have in Jeremiah 36 is God sending his words, them being written down. The devil doesn't like it, so he destroys that copy of it. And God says, that's not going to stop me. Write them again, Jeremiah. Because even though Jeremiah may have forgotten the words, God didn't. He knew exactly what he said. Jeremiah, write them down again. By the way, add some more to it. So that's exactly what he did. And I submit to you that every offense that Satan takes at God's word to try to destroy it, God always just sends another one in its place. You can't stop the word of God. Amen. First Corinthians 14, 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Look at that verse. Uh, a lady sent me, bless her heart. She sent me some books that her and some other people worked on. They are, they are, these are people that have come out of what's called the New Apostolic Reformation. You hear me talk about the Bethel Church in Redding, California? They're the anti-Bethel. And I'm telling you, they are the anti-Bethel. Okay? Number one, there's probably a thousand more of them than there are here. Number two, they don't follow the words of this book. The words of this book are too restrictive to them. So they don't follow it. So I wrote the lady back and I said, thank you for sending these to me. I'm going to go through them and I might, I might interview her uh, about what's in the books. But... Uh, she, they're going to expose these false doctrines that are in these churches. And because these people say, well, I'm a prop, God has called me with the office of a prophet. That means that I can, what I say is the word of God. And I was introduced to this idea, Brother George. A guy asked me, do you have a house prophet in your church? Yeah, his name's King James. No, 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 no. You need somebody in that church who will hear from God and then speak what God tells them to speak in that church. That's a two-headed church. The, and, and really, the pastor would not have any authority in that church because it would be the house prophet. In this case, this guy had a house prophet test. It was a woman, Melissa. Jezebel woman who, whatever she dreamed, that was the word of God. Okay? And it was contrary to what was in the book. So read that again. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You understand that? If you think that you heard from God, you better check the Bible first. Okay? Galatians 1.20, Now the things which I write unto you, behold before God, I lie not. Again, Revelation 1.11, What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches. So there's a, a, a famous wood carving of God doing that with Ezekiel. He had the words on the scroll. He gave it to Ezekiel. Ezekiel then took it and ate it up. John did the same thing. The angel, when, when John wrote the words, or no, when the angel came down in Revelation 10 with the book in his right hand, he gives it to John. He says, John, eat this book. And John ate it, just like Ezekiel did. And when he ate it, he was told, now go and speak this before many nations and tongues. Preach it all over the world, John. Now that you have the words, go tell everybody what I said. So that's the, that's the first 
primary doctrine. And if we don't believe this one, the rest of them, you, you, won't, you won't believe them either. If you don't believe that the very words that John wrote down were the exact words that God wanted written down, if you don't believe that, number one, what do you believe? Who do you believe? What doctrines, where do you get your doctrines from? Or then it becomes like you see often, especially in the book of Judges, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There has to be a rule book. Constitution is the rule book of America, and I believe the Constitution should be followed by the people as well as the politicians. Amen. Aren't you sick of that? You guys, aren't you sick of that, like I am? Sick of politicians who think that they don't have to follow the laws that they force down on us? I've had it. I don't want to live in a country full of corruption like that. Amen? Well, I wouldn't go to a church where the pastor thought that he was above the Word of God. I wouldn't do it. But that's how I used to think. My wife will tell you that. All right, so that's rule number one. The inspiration of every word that those men wrote down. They were the perfect Word of God. So then next week, I mean, take a look up on the screen. That's what some of the manuscripts that we found looked like. Okay, uh, what is it? A Bible that's falling apart belongs to a Christian that isn't? Amen? Okay, they were falling apart because they were used and read and used and read and so on and so on. So how then did God preserve that? That's what we'll look at next Wednesday.